Hi everybody, I'm Girl Writes What, and uh, much to my chagrin, it is uh, over a week since I uploaded a video, so uh, I, I figured I'd better get on it and get something done. And uh, somebody actually recently sent me a link to an article in The Atlantic uh, called What's Wrong with the Violence Against Women Act. And uh, and I was going to read the whole thing and, and kind of pick it apart and and uh, see how many of its points I could confirm and uh, what exactly it leaves out of its analysis, which is usually a very great deal. Um, but, but as I started to read it, I kept on returning uh, again and again to uh, the subheading of the article, which reads as follows. Uh, a bill that was designed to rectify gender discrimination tips the balance too far, putting accused men at an unfair disadvantage. And, I mean, I kept coming back to it because it just, something just seemed really backwards about it. And, uh, and it finally struck me uh, what it was. It was that the bill was actually never designed to rectify any kind of gender discrimination was actually designed to increase the gender discrimination that already existed in the law. Um, believing that there was any kind of gender discrimination against women in domestic violence law or in society's attitudes towards domestic violence is, is to essentially rewrite history, women's history, and, and just utterly ignore men's history altogether. Up until the early 1700s in the UK, there existed uh, archaic laws regarding um, a husband's discretion to physically chastise his wife. By this law, a husband was permitted to give his, his wife mild correction. And I think it's important to note that this law existed because a husband was legally answerable for his wife's actions. If she committed a public crime or a misdeed, uh, say, stole from someone or assaulted someone or even gambled away the family fortune, it was her husband who was held to account legally, financially, and socially for that misdeed. This law uh, allowed him enough power of correction within reasonable bounds uh, to, to deal with that kind of responsibility. And it actually prohibited husband, husbands from using violence on their wives. Now, a couple of things. I'm kind of guessing that considering the nature of the culture back then, uh, like how common corporal punishment was uh, with respect to children and not just by parents, uh, or convicted criminals or servants and apprentices, the 1720s definition of violence is probably a lot different from our definition today. And the 1720s definition of it within the context of domestic violence, uh, wherein the current definition includes things like not speaking to your wife or using logic on her. The old definition is going to be a lot different uh, from our definition of domestic violence now. Now, considering that a husband was answerable for his wife's behavior in public and any wrongs she might commit against others, forbidding him any means of holding her accountable to him would have just been an egregious imbalance of power within the institution of marriage. The law equally afforded men the right uh, to correct the behavior of any individual for whom he was held legally answerable, his children or his apprentices, for instance. And finally, before anybody pounces on the idea that men were answerable for their wife's behavior because men were in authority over their wives, and that this authority was a benefit given them by a system that was designed to oppress women, I'm, I'm going to flip the sequence of that line of thought around. Instead of starting on the assumption that marriage is an institution to oppress women for men's benefit, uh, therefore husbands have authority over their wives, therefore men are answerable for their wives' behavior since they could order those wives to do bad things, I'm going to posit a different sequence of logic based on a different primary assumption. Marriage was an institution designed to serve children and protect women. Therefore, women were entitled to the protection of their husbands. Therefore, men must stand between their wives and the violence of the rest of the world, including that of the law. Therefore, men must have authority over their wives. 
That is, if a man must be answerable for his wife in order to protect her from the consequences of even her own actions, then she should, at the very least, be answerable to him. Now, why would I posit a se this sequence of logic based on this different starting point? Because there were all kinds of laws uh, limiting what husbands were legally permitted to do to the, wi the wives who were under their authority, not just physically, but financially as well. There were laws like coverture uh, to protect women from financial abuse by husbands. The law of coverture required a woman who uh, owned property and, say, wanted to sell it, maybe she had a house that she'd brought with her into the marriage, uh, to be interviewed outside her husband's presence by a legal official to determine that she really did want to sell it and that her husband wasn't forcing her to do so. And I also think that my uh, starting point assumption uh, is more valid than the other because lifelong marriage itself is a raw deal for men. A man's value in the sexual marketplace often increases with age as he accumulates wealth and social status, while a woman's always decreases and eventually fizzles to nothing, usually long before she'll ever die of old age. In a truly male-dominated society where marriage really was designed to oppress women for the benefit of men, it would have been legally easy, socially acceptable, and even encouraged for a man to divorce his wife the moment her youth and beauty faded if he could trade her in for someone better. Maybe a lot better, considering he'd have had a decade or two to acquire more wealth, considering he owned his children, who uh, in an age of child labor would have uh, worked alongside him to uh, contribute to the growth of that wealth. And frankly, the entire notion that marriage is the equivalent of female oppression and slavery is belied by all of the hand-wringing from modern pundits across the political spectrum, including feminists, clamoring that women want husbands and men aren't doing their duty and dragging themselves to the altar. If marriage is a form of slavery for women, why is it women who still desire marriage? And if it's an institution devised to benefit men, why is it men who are avoiding it like the plague? So, I think it's perfectly, perfectly reasonable to assume that in the past a man was expected to stand as a shield between his wife and the dangers of the world, even when those dangers were posed by the legal or criminal consequences of her own actions. Does anyone believe it would be remotely fair to, um, to hand a man the job of bodyguard and handler to hold him accountable not only for the safety but the behavior of his charge, and then give him no means to enforce his judgment on that charge? To say to him, if this person is harmed, you will be held accountable for it, and if they commit a crime, you will be punished for it, but oh, by the way, they don't have to do a damn thing you say? I didn't think so either. As early as 1768, when Lord Blackstone gathered up all the assorted laws of England into one big book, it was made clear that physical violence and even physical restraint by husbands against wives was in violation of the law. Though he noted it was common for such violations among the underclass to be swept under the judicial rug, maybe that was because female members of the underclass would be more likely to find themselves on the wrong side of the law, male members of the underclass spent more hours a day performing labor and therefore had less time to supervise the behavior of their wives, and all members of the underclass were subject to hand-to-mouth living that meant jailing a battering husband would subject his wife to financial destitution? Likewise, in the U.S., there have been laws against wife battering since before the American Revolution, and by 1870 it was officially illegal in nearly every state. I've only heard of one gender-neutral domestic violence law during this period, Massachusetts Bay Colony's Law of 1655. Even prior to the drafting of these laws, wife batterers could and could be and were in fact arrested and penalized for abusing their wives using the simple charge of criminal assault and battery. Punishments for wife beating included things like 40 lashes at the public whipping post, fines ranging from 255 to $1,000, and sentences of one to five years in prison. Moreover, Male family members, neighbors, and members of religious congregations were known to enact vigilante justice on wife beaters. Uh, sometimes they'd, they'd just gang up and beat the crap out of the guy, or they'd abduct and whip him, uh, or even run him out of town. 
I, even in the accounts that I've read from feminist sources that include ex excerpts from women's diaries, uh, there's often a male relative or family friend who steps in and removes the battered woman from her batterer's immediate presence, or even from his household, when serious abuse was witnessed. And before anyone jumps in and claims that these protections and restrictions were based not on gender, but on the power imbalance between those who had authority over others, husbands, and those who were under that power, wives, I'm going to call bullshit. Why? Because we have a perfect example of a huge socially and legally systemic ungendered power imbalance in history, wherein women received protections that equally powerless and vulnerable men did not. Slavery. In France and Spain, in the early days of slavery, provisions in the slave code existed to protect pregnant and sick women from physical abuse. Other legal amendments prohibited sexual abuse uh, or use of female slaves by slave owners, with respect to both rape by owners and pimping. In the 19th century, Britain introduced laws to limit the types of punishment allowed with respect to slave women, punishing, uh, forbidding punishing one in public, restricting the number of lashes she could receive, and prohibiting any physical punishment at all for pregnant slave women. And though enforcement of these laws probably left a lot to be desired, no such protections existed for male slaves to be enforced or not. Only two-thirds as many slave women were brought over to the European colonies as slave men. However, in many colonies, females outnumbered males because they lived longer. I wonder why. And keep in mind, too, that even when I was a kid, children was, were still receiving corporal punishment in some schools, including caning. So attitudes towards physical punishment were very different from what they are today. Yet wives, and even female slaves, had legal protections that prohibited those in authority of, over them from going too far, while men had no such protections. Nor were they protected in any way from the violence of their wives. In fact, when a man was battered by his wife, the community held him answerable for that, too. In France, when neighbors discovered a man in their community was being dominated or beaten by his wife, he was paraded around town while seated backward on a donkey, holding its tail, while the crowd ridiculed him. In England, battered men were routinely strapped to carts and subjected to the derision and mockery of the crowd, essentially punished for the abuse they suffered at the hands of their wives. Abuse, I might add that had no legally codified limits or restrictions in most jurisdictions. And while many experts have attributed this treatment to a kind of blind adherence to patriarchal norms of husband as lord of his household and systemic contempt for weak men that still goes on today, when you look a little deeper, it's not quite so simple. Life was a lot harsher back then. And as I've said before, when life in a community is really harsh, Things like individual well-being, safety, and fulfillment tend to take a back seat to more important things like social cohesion and collective survivalism. Back then, when a, marry, when a woman married, there was only one legal entity to which she was fully answerable, her husband. A woman who beat her husband was seen as a huge threat to the stability of the community. Here was a woman capable of defying the socially enforced and legally endorsed norm of husbandly authority, a breaker of social and legal taboos. If such a woman, one already predisposed to ignore the rules of society, got up to malicious or harmful behavior outside the home, there was no way for the community to hold her personally accountable for her actions. That was her husband's job, and clearly he couldn't be trusted with it. If she committed a crime, her husband might even be sent to prison for it, and if that happened, what little external constraint there'd been on her behavior, her husband's very poor authority, would be out of the picture entirely. She would, in effect, be free to wreak havoc on the community, a socially irresponsible woman who is answerable to none. Forcing a man to ride the donkey backwards served a couple of purposes within the community. For one, it put other men on notice, reminding them how important it was to social cohesion for them to exercise authority within their households and control misbehaving wives. Any man watching or participating in such a spectacle would be reminded just what things would be like for him if he failed the community in the same way. And secondly, it essentially stripped the battered man of all respect and social status within that community. 
which was a consequence his wife, who shared in his respect and social status, could not avoid. She could, be, she could not be punished directly for her behavior, but she could be punished through the public humiliation of her husband and the decrease in her own social status that accompanied it. If the contempt of the community extended as far as something like him getting fired from his job, she'd be forced to live with the consequences of that as well. A few things have changed since those days when it comes to battered husbands. The elaborate rituals of public ridicule are gone, but men are, by and large, still held accountable for the abuse they suffer, and women excused for their misbehavior within marriage. There exists little outreach or assistance for such men, because patriarchy theory and its twisting of reality fooled everyone into believing battered husbands couldn't possibly exist. Female batterers are still not held fully accountable for their behavior. And the community, far from intervening the way it has always done when women were battered by their husbands, has pretty much ignored the entire problem. Instead, we expect individual men to deal with the problem on their own. Legislation and arrest policies are more biased than they ever were, but it's no longer because we see men as a shield between their wives and the violence of the rest of the world, even the violence of the law. It's because we've been fooled into believing that marriage was an institution designed to oppress rather than protect and support women. We've been tricked into believing marriage was always a raw deal for women and a great one for men, despite the fact that single motherhood, which is a struggle even today, would have been a one-way ticket to extreme poverty for 99% of women through history, and despite the fact that its lifelong component was designed to keep men from abandoning their wives after menopause rather than the other way around. We've been tricked into, th into thinking the job of a husband was to be a bully rather than a bodyguard, and that male-dominated societies are oppressive to women because, hey, when men are in charge, they will always act in ways that benefit men without ever considering the well-being of women. We've been fooled into thinking the extra rights and freedoms men had were cookies given to them just because they were men, rather than because women were biologically vulnerable and dependent on those individual men, and giving men those extra rights and freedoms enabled them to do the job society expected of them, to support and protect women. We've been fooled into thinking the authority society gave husbands within marriage was a means to oppress women, rather than a necessary component of men's expectation to protect them, even from the consequences of their own actions. We've been tricked into believing the exception, the husband who abused his authority to victimize and cruelly damage his wife, was the rule. We've been fooled into believing the battered husband is a time-honored and well-worn comic trope that makes appearances in Bugs Bunny cartoons on Saturday mornings because it's always been rare, rather than because it defies our internal gendered narrative of women as harmless and deserving of protection, and our expectation on men to be strong and capable of taking care of themselves and protecting others. We've been bamboozled into believing that domestic violence against women was never considered a crime until feminism arrived to enlighten us, and that it was always socially acceptable, despite tons of historical evidence to the contrary. And the safer the world gets, and the less directly dependent on individual men women become for their support and protection, the easier it is for us to believe that men are brutes and abusers by nature, and the easier it is for us to toss them in the trash when they're abused. We don't even have to notice them now. Because before the age of the pill, child support enforcement, subsidized daycare, safe streets, welfare benefits, and safe, easy indoor jobs, the task of protecting and providing for women, that was one necessary task, and it fell to individual men. And the importance of that job necessitated giving men the tools to do it and punishing them when they failed. Whereas 200 years ago, the community could not afford to pretend a battered husband didn't exist. Well, I guess we've come a long way, baby, and arrived at a point in our social evolution where society 
rather than individual men, can do the job of supporting women and protecting them from harm, even when that harm arises from their own actions, and where battered men, instead of being subjected to ritualized humiliations, are essentially invisible to everyone, even when they're standing right in front of us, because we can afford not to care about them one way or the other. By defying our gendered assumptions, battered men make us so uncomfortable we'll recast them as abusers themselves whenever we possibly can, and when we can't, we'd rather close our eyes and stick our fingers in our ears when they beg for help than acknowledge their existence. And when even people who are smart enough to realize that the Violence Against Women Act is the equivalent of gender apartheid are still laboring under the misperception that historical laws and so social attitudes about domestic violence discriminated against women. Is it any wonder it's so fucking easy for the rest of society to sweep all those male victims under the rug? Anyhow, that's all I have to say about that little bit. Um, and uh, I got some work to do in my kitchen because it's a mess. So I guess I will uh, see you all hopefully in less than a week this time. So... Ciao.